wasn't that hopeful in, in the nation of Israel. Uh, it is thought that Isaiah began to um, speak to the people of Israel around 740 before Christ, so maybe over 200 years after King Solomon, and it hadn't been going very well in the nation of Israel, the northern kingdom, as it were. Uh, every king was doing his own thing, mixing the worship of Yahweh with the worship of idols. And we read at the beginning of Isaiah how the ruling elite often oppressed the poor, so the vulnerable, the weak, uh, were not having the support they needed, and uh, injustice was rife too. But in the midst of this time, just like the times we live in today, uh, there is hope because there is God, and there is Christ. And here Isaiah has this amazing vision of a shoot which will come from the stump of Jesse. A tree stump cut down. It seems like there is no life left yet. God, but God, but for God, there is life. Hmm? The stump of Jesse, of course, is a picture of the nation of Israel, which was going to experience hardship, being taken into exile by enemy nations. That was God's purpose for them at the time, to, to discipline them for their ongoing stubborn uh, rebellion against him and his kingship. They had failed. God's people had failed to be what God had intended for them. So he raises up a shoot from the roots, a branch that will bear fruit. Israel had failed to bear fruit. Yet someone will come and will fulfill God's loving and good purposes for this world. <coughs> Remember that mission, God's mission, God's plan of salvation starts in his heart, in his loving heart for us human beings as well as for the rest of creation. In times like this, uh, we may do well to reflect on questions of who are we as his people and what are we here for? Scripture answers this in many different ways, but we are the bride of Christ, and we are looking forward to his coming. And he sees us, he sees us as beautiful people in Christ. We are forgiven, we are cleansed, we are holy in Christ. And we are here to bear his image in this world. His love, his grace, his mercy towards this world. We are here to extend a hand of peace, to be reconcilers, to be peacemakers. And the picture, the vision that Isaiah has is a vision of shalom. Um, yeah, shalom is a Hebrew word that entails much more than just absence of conflict. It is a Hebrew word that encapsulates God's vision for this world, of harmony, of well-being, of good relationships, of loving relationships, of fellowship with God, with one another. And this is the vision that Isaiah has in a time that was not easy, in a time that was dark in Israel. Jesus has a mission for us, doesn't he? And when he was about to depart this earth, he prays to God in John 17, verse 18, and he says, As you, referring to God, his Father, sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world, us. As you, in the same way, we have the same mission 
We are to carry on the mission of Christ in this world as reconcilers, as peacemakers. And so this passage gives us some idea, some vision of what God wants this world to be. And of course we, we know that this, this is a vision that will one day be totally and utterly fulfilled in Christ's second coming. In the meantime, we are here to be peacemakers and reconcilers. We need peace in our lives, in our families, in our communities, in our world. And Isaiah has this wonderful vision of a shoot coming from the stump of Jesse. And a particular characteristic that this servant of God will have is that he will delight in the fear of the Lord. The Spirit of God will be on him and he will delight in the fear of God. This phrase, the fear of God, is not really referring to terror, you know, to, to, to um, being afraid, um, but rather it's, it's referring to a deep reverence for a holy God and that results in a loving obedience to him. So the servant that God is promising to raise up and has come is someone who will do God's will, unlike the nation of Israel at the time. This servant is given power to rule, to judge. In, an, in verses 3 to 5, we read about his rule, his judgment, and actually a judgment that is positive as well as it is fearful. He will, his judgment is a judgment that will bring righteousness, rightness into relationships, into human relationships. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide what he hears with his ears, but with righteousness he will judge the need. He was justice, he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. The ruling people in Israel at the time, the kings, who often judged, who were the judges at the time, misused, abused their power and exploited the poor and the needy. And so here, it echoes, or Jesus echoes this in, in, in Luke chapter 4 when he talks about his mission, that he's come to, to minister to the poor, to set the poor free spiritually, I think, and here we're looking also at physical restoration later on in this passage. <clears throat> Those in power have been given power to do good, not to do evil. The kings of Israel did a lot of evil at the time, but this king will be different. He will bring healing to relationships, restore relationships between people. He will right wrong relationships. The ultimate judgment when Christ comes back again, where we all have to give an account, is, I think, alluded to um, in this passage too. So what does that mean for us? It means in our relationships with each other, we need to be peacemakers. We need to be aware of issues of injustice in our world so that we can speak out, that we can pray and advocate. You know, we live in a very unfair and unjust world, don't we? We live in a world, for, for, for example, one-third of the world's food is wasted and much of it in our fridges. Yet, one billion of the world's population goes to bed hungry every night. We see leaders around us in society and in church that abuse their position of power rather than for the good of all. We see transnational companies working around the globe in a globalized world getting very, very rich. Yet, we have people in our world that um, can hardly look after themselves. And often these transnational companies 
have ways and means to exploit resources in poor nations and not pay their due taxes in those nations. They are headquartered in Switzerland, in the UK and other places where taxation is much lower than in Zambia, for example. And, uh, and they have, they have clever accountants and, and, and tax lawyers and so on that um, export the riches of poor nations and uh, don't pay their due share there. It should be our concern as we live in a democracy, as we can write, as we can be informed, as we have these days many organizations that inform us about such injustices. Uh, it is our responsibility to stay informed and, and to lend our voice uh, to, um, to see justice done. <clears throat> because God is a God of justice. His character is a character of righteousness, and we are to reflect it in our lives. Maybe that's in our families, in our jobs, maybe we are bosses, in our, and we have people under us. How do we use our power? We are parents. How do we use the power of a parent? We can use it to the, for the good of our children or not. And, yeah, so it's God's concern that we should exercise righteousness and justice in relationship. We are peacemakers, we are reconcilers. So let us stay informed and pray and advocate for justice. Our churches, churches should be known, shouldn't they, as communities of love. Jesus says that it's by the love you have for one another uh, that you are known to be my disciples. And how hard that is sometimes. It's dying to ourselves. It's reaching out to others. And our neighbors. Next door at work. And in a globalized world. Our choices as consumers may impact the poor in other countries. Our electronics are manufactured far away from here. Our shoes we wear, our, food, our clothes we wear, and so on, are often made in places where workers don't have many rights. So, but it's good these days that we are aware of these things and that we shop accordingly, even though it may cost us a little bit more. Those are issues, I think, that God is concerned about and that we should be concerned about too. Justin, who works with us, every Saturday in his free time, he goes out and meets children in his township, and he, they're all poor children, and he has been running group, a group there to, and teaches them from Scripture, and he teaches them to grow vegetables, and something really lovely is happening there. Um, and... As, as they grow vegetables and sell them, they are helping other children who don't have enough money maybe to buy simple school materials to go to school. And parents have got excited about it. Children have started little vegetable gardens around their house. So there's little, little things we may be able to do uh, to help others um, experience um, better relationships. So this servant will rule with justice and right wrong relationships. And so we should be concerned for that too and work for justice and right relationships. And the picture goes on. And it's a very interesting picture, isn't it? The wolf will, lie, will, will live with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together and a little child will lead them. Well, that doesn't happen in this world, does it? Well, it's a picture of the conflict that there is there in creation, uh, being resolved, being fixed, um, being made whole. It's a picture of harmony, isn't it? And actually Isaiah repeats it. And it, there's like a climax there, isn't it? The infants will play near the cobra's den. 
and the young child will put its hands in a viper's nest. I don't know about you, but when I think about snakes, I don't like snakes. <laughs> and, and here we have this picture of total harmony. No danger, no harm. And this is the rule of the servant that God has raised up. And this is where we are heading. A world, a renewed world, a world of hope, of peace, of harmony, of light, no darkness, no conflict, no harm. What a wonderful picture Isaiah gives us here. We are very aware, aren't we, these days about what's happening to our to, the, to creation. This COP27 is going on right now. And um, rightly so, we, are, we should be concerned about creation because God is concerned about his creation. After all, he created it, he sustains it, and he redeems it. In Colossians 1, six, um, n yeah, 19 to 20, For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, in Christ, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Christ gave his life to reconcile us human beings to God, but also to renew the rest of creation, all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven. It's a picture of harmony. Creation, Romans 8, talks about creation groaning until Christ comes again, till we will be revealed as to what we really are in Christ, and creation will experience that liberation from the curse that it is under. So creation is of immense value to God. Christ died to set it free, to redeem it from the curse. And it's also in creation that God has given us the sphere where we are to express his image through our humanness. We are given dominion, we are given power, aren't we? In Genesis 1.28, he talks about that. Over God's creation. What an incredible thought that is. But how do we use that power? Do we use it to abuse, to exploit, to destroy God's creation? Or do we use it to develop it, to manage it carefully for God's glory? Hmm? Creation does display God's glory still in many places, but in many places it does not. And uh, yeah, we've used it and abused it. I think that we could talk much about this, but we should respect the resources that God's given us in creation and the resources that we derive from creation, because everything does come from creation, doesn't it? We should respect it because it belongs to God. He is its creator. We should take responsibility for it because we've been given authority to caringly manage it respect and responsibility towards our resources, towards creation. And then we should also exercise restraint, not unfettered greed to exploit the resources that there are. I think as Christians we are called to live simply, simple, simple in a way, and that's a difficult thing to determine what it really is. But yeah, we need to exercise restraint um, so that others can live and God's creation can thrive. We've all heard about the four R's, I think, these days, reduce, reuse, recycle, and refuse. Um, Julie and I, um, we have this, you know, joke, you know, or it's funny, we, we come back here, we have our, some of our winter clothes, you know, stored away in a suitcase in Switzerland, actually, and those come out every time we get back to Europe. And recently I was looking at the photograph that was taken like, you know, I um, can't remember, seven or eight years ago. 
and I'm wearing the same shirt in the photograph. <laughs> I'm reusing. Well, I'm just saying, you know, we, 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 we often want the newest as consumers. So we live in a consumerist society, isn't it? We want the newest, the latest, but actually what we have, we can reuse it so many times. I, I, I read an article in Switzerland, you know, there are s there's so many good quality electronic gadgets lying around, I can't remember the figures, in people's homes that can be reused, we can refurbish them, and so on. It's one way we can take care of the resources that God has given us. Another thing we demand today is cheap food, and we complain about the food prices, but actually in the 1950s, food prices were one-third of a person's income on average. Uh, I, I just read a government website um, that in 2020, 2021, our expenditure in the UK on average was about 14% on food. So it's half compared to what people were spending. Uh, but we've become greedy, we've become discontent. Um, we need to learn again to be content, to exercise restraint towards creation and its resources. There is an, a Christian mission called Arosha. Um, it's Portuguese for the rock. I don't know whether anyone has come across them. It's spelled A, and then another word, Rocha, R-O-C-H-A. And it's worth looking up their website um, because they have many ideas for local churches of how we can help each other think through how we can steward the resources and creation that God has given us. I would encourage you to get ideas there. There's a little book that was written by Ruth Valerio. I think she works with Tear Fund these days. And it's called L is for Lifestyle. And she gives many examples of how she adjusted her lifestyle um, to exercise respect, responsibility, and restrain towards God's creation. And um, it's a little book that is easy to read. Ruth Valerio, L is for Lifestyle. The UK government um, has a, a scheme, I think it's called Plant the Future. Have you heard of it? Uh, it's a tree planting initiative. And uh, you can get involved there. So there are many opportunities. I really do think in the time that we live, um, Christians getting involved and being seen to have a theology of creation care and sharing, actually, that God, you know, is interested in, our, in the way we care for creation. As Christians, we should be interested. It can be a bridge builder to people, to young people. You know, many young people, as you, I'm sure, are aware of, are worried about the future of the planet. And we have had Extinction Rebellion, and we've had you know, these kinds of things happening because they're worried, because it's their future, not my future. You know, it's not us oldies, you know. We are, we are not going to experience what is predicted they will experience. Um, so this is an opportunity for the gospel. Um, get in, getting involved and stuck in with, with such, not necessarily join a movement like that, but but helping people understand that as Christians we have something to say about this and we have something to do about this and we are concerned. So, um, Arosha UK, it's an international organization that was started by a, a British um, pastor um, um, some in the, in the 80s, I think. Um, it's grown into an international environmental mission and uh, in the UK they, they help local churches become more aware of the issues around it and what we can do about it. Because the servant, the servant gave his life that creation will be renewed. So we are to be signposts to this servant, aren't we, in our lives and the way we live. <coughs> and finally, the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. In that day, 
the root of Jesse will stand as the banner for the peoples and the nations will rally to him and his resting place will be glorious. Shalom. There will be rest for this world, a troubled world. It's interesting here, the servant is called the root of Jesse and at the beginning of the passage, the shoot of Jesse because of course he is eternal. It's Jesus. He was there before the beginning. And here this glorious picture, this wonderful picture of people from all nations, black, white, orange, yellow, whatever, <laughs> rich and poor, we will all be there. There will be from all nations. And there's the banner. And, and the Israelites would have understood this very well. You know, the army captain or general would raise the banner and the troops would rally. And here it's the banner of Christ, the ultimate king. And yes, there will be people from all nations in that glorious resting place that we look forward to. Yet we have, as Jesus says, we have a mission so that people will be there. Paul says it in this way. This is, a, this is good and pleases God our Savior who wants all people to be saved. That's God's heart, isn't it? We, we said at the beginning, mission starts in God's heart because he loves this world, he loves people. And come to a knowledge of the truth. And there are so many lies out there, aren't they? Today, we need to share the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself up as a ransom for all people. We remember today the people who gave their lives so that in Europe we could have peace many years ago. And we, we, we remember them with reverence. But there is one man who gave his life so that the whole world could have peace. And we need to gossip the gospel, don't we? A friend of mine I was talking to yesterday has this idea that churches should practice, people, Christians should practice sharing their testimony. Practice it in small groups several times until they can say it in three minutes and then record it and then upload it to his website. He has, a, he has an organization, Connect for Life. And... Um, and, and so he's going to, you know, go around and, and he's, he feels God has put this on his heart. He's going to go around uh, to churches to, to, to try to get this off the ground. So that when you meet someone in a queue and you have a little conversation about him, about, uh, about you know, with, with the person, you could say to that person, look, I'm a Christian. I have, if you want to listen to my story of change, uh, there, there, is, there is a link, and there is my number, and you can find my story. And then when they connect to that website, they will see thousands of people's story, millions of people's story from all around the world, and, and be able to read and read the gospel. Well, that's one initiative. That's a great thought, I thought. That's really good uh, if that can come off, and I think it will. So we need to not give up in gossiping the gospel, in sharing the gospel, sharing our testimonies. I do it far too little, I know. So, God's mission is cross-shaped, isn't it? It points up, out and down, up to our relationship with God, out to our relationship with our neighbors, down to our relationship with creation. Mission is cross-shaped because it does not happen without sacrifice. Christ died, and he calls us to die to ourselves and follow him. Mission is cross-shaped, but the cross is empty. Christ has risen, and he will come again. So let us pray, and let us work while there is time. Amen.